and happy Easter. So it is honestly, do not tell my children the best time of the year. Uh, I know they would say Christmas because, you know, of all the stash, but Easter is just incredible. Easter is what makes us Christ followers. This is the reason we are in church. Uh, this is the reason that we are Christians. And I'm so excited that we get to share this moment together. Uh, and I'm just overwhelmed thinking back to a couple of years ago where we were literally watching our Easter services online. Uh, and I was crying in my office thinking, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, so I'm so grateful that we get this moment together, this Easter celebration moment. Would you be so kind as to stand with me? Me, I'd love to pray uh, before I get into the Word today. Would you uh, place your hand on your heart or open up your hands any way that uh, you would receive today? Father God, I am so, so grateful for this opportunity to be in your house once again. God, we're overwhelmed that we get to celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for your work on the cross. Thank you that you overcame death and the grave. And today, we get a glimpse into the work that you did for us. And we're so grateful. Would your Holy Spirit use my words? Would you anoint me powerfully today uh, to speak your word into the hearts of every single person uh, individually? Because I know that you meet each one of us today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. You know, as a way of preparing my heart uh, to go into this Easter weekend, I have been reading the four accounts of the Gospels. And the four accounts each tell a different angle from each of the, uh, those who wrote it. And it shows you a little bit more about the resurrection, uh, the whole story of Jesus. And it is absolutely beautiful. But I was struck this time by the drama of it all. When I was reading it, it felt like it came to life. There was like a new visualization, and it really felt to me like a bit of a soap opera. You know, the extremes of what took place. And I'm just going to pull out a couple for you so that you can see and hear and experience some of the drama of it all. And so some of what took place was celebration and mourning. Devotion and abandonment, defeat and victory, fear and faith, betrayal and remorse, rejection and acceptance, confusion and certainty, enemies and friends, guilt and innocence, suffering and joy. You know, the last week of Jesus' life, it was full of emotion. It was dramatic. There were these juxtapositions. There was this side of the extreme and this side of the extreme and everything in between. There was so much drama. You know, it was so dramatic. It reminded me of a roar, the roar of a lion in the bush. Give me a wave if you have ever heard a lion roar. Give me a wave. It is dramatic. And you can hear it for up to eight kilometers. It reverberates right throughout the bush. And you know that the king of the bush is there. Right? It's so dramatic. And so the last week of Jesus' life was filled with drama. And it was filled with roars. Some of the roars were this. The roars of the adoring fans shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Some of the roars were, were from the garden where Jesus falls to his knees and he literally sweats drops of blood and he says, not my will, but yours. Another roar was those whips. Can you hear them? The whips. Other roars were the crowd shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Other roars were those nails. Can you hear the nails? Crucify him. Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Another roar reverberating in history. The roar of surrender and the roar of it is finished. What a beautiful roar. Beautiful roar. <laughs> then there's the roar of the empty cross. 
the roar of the empty cross, the roar of the stone rolling away, and the roar of the empty grave. The empty grave speaks louder than anything else, and it reverberates through history. And because of the empty cross and the empty grave, we are Christ followers. And I am so grateful for the work that he did on the cross and the roars that went through history. But you know, then I take a look at my life and it looks anything but a roar. It looks more like a squeak. You know, there I am, squeak, squeak, squeaking about, you know. The only one who can hear me is the one cat in earshot, you know. That, that's what my life feels like. It's so ordinary and boring and mundane and like just a normal little life, you know. Um, is this me? Is it my mic? It's my pack. So let me just try and sort it out. Sorry, guys. Okay, tell me if it continues, then I'll swap mics. If it does. And I was just thinking, like, my life is mundane. It involves shopping and cooking and cleaning and after school activities and work and homework. And it just squeaks, squeaks, squeaks everywhere. And I often wonder, like, does my life count for anything? Am I making a difference? Is there any significance to my life? Is it reverberating into history? Am I leaving a legacy? Is there something that I am doing that is profound? Is there a roar with my life? And I, perhaps you're just like me, just an ordinary, everyday human being, right? Where you're just like, well, is my life significant? Am I making a difference? It just feels like an ordinary life, going about my ordinariness, squeaking about, you know, no roaring happening. But don't get me wrong. Like, I'm super, super grateful that I was not crucified, right? <laughs> like, I, I'll, you know, I'll pass on that. Uh, part of me thinks I would like to be resurrected. Uh, I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, but you would have to die in order to be resurrected. So, you know, I think I would, I, I would pass on the whole lot. But I, I would like my life to roar. And I'm sure that you would like your life to roar as well. And so when reading the last week of Jesus' life, I found two ordinary everyday guys who I could relate to. And that's what I'm going to be preaching from today. Because the whole biblical account um, of Jesus and his life, it was just way too dramatic for me. And I couldn't relate to it. But these two guys, they were ordinary. They were everyday. They were just two guys who were confused, going on a walk, talking about Jesus and the events of his life. And I'd like to read it for us today. And it's only found in one of the Gospels. So if you're looking for it, it's only found in Luke. And it's found in Luke 24. Now, it's a fairly lengthy passage, so I give you permission to slap the person next to you uh, if they fall asleep, okay? <laughs> then it would be a great uh, honor and privilege. You will literally be preaching with me in this moment. Um, and if you get into trouble, you just blame me. Okay. Are you all good? Ready to go? All right. Luke 24, 13 to 34. And it says, that same day. Now, it's important for us to understand that that same day is the day that Jesus was resurrected. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were talking, uh, were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles, which is 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked, they discussed these things. Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here these last few days. In other words, where have you been? Have you been living under a rock? How have you missed all of this? And then they carry on. 
What things, Jesus asks so innocently. Uh, the things that happened to Jesus. Now what, look at the words that are highlighted. The man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. Do you see the progression? A man, a prophet, a teacher. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped. This is such a powerful line. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group uh, of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of the men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the woman had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah was would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting so late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he suddenly took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Then they said to each other, and I love this phrase, and this is why I am preaching this sermon, didn't our hearts burn within us? As he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. You know, this is such an inspiring text, friends. It is such a beautiful, beautiful biblical account. And the reason I love it is because these two disciples, they were ordinary. They were everyday people. They were on a journey. They had hoped and prayed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then their hopes and dreams were dashed. And then they were, to be honest, I think they were just escaping Jerusalem, leaving Jerusalem, going like, I just got to get away from that place. And they went on a journey and they were discussing as friends their confusion. I don't understand what has happened. I don't know why, why his body is missing and where he is and what has happened. And we really hoped he was the Messiah. It was just so, such a beautiful account. And on their journey, Jesus meets them. And this is what I love the most. Jesus meets them in their pain. He meets them in their disillusion. He meets them in their disappointment. He meets them in their grief. And he listens. He listens. He acknowledges it. So this is the beautiful journey. And then he goes about teaching them and explaining so that they can understand. And when they get to Emmaus, they don't want this conversation to end. They invite him, come on, come home with us, please. We don't want this conversation to end. And he comes home with them, and all of a sudden, as he breaks the bread, their eyes are opened, and they see that he is the Messiah. Honestly, it is a beautiful, beautiful account. <laughs> Friends, these followers of Jesus experienced their own little Easter. They went on that one journey from a Good Friday to an Easter Sunday, a little Easter. There was a resurrection that took place in their lives. A little Easter, a moment where death and depression and darkness and despondency turned to celebration and joy. And the part I love about this account the most is it says that within the hour, Within the hour, they went back to Jerusalem. They went back to share the incredible news, the celebratory news that Jesus was in fact alive. They couldn't keep that to themselves. And so they experienced their own little Easter. It was a turnaround. It was dramatic. 
The, the journey started on Good Friday and ended on Easter Sunday, and they couldn't help but share that news. Trevor Hudson says this, that God's love is at work in our lives, seeking to bring life where there is darkness and death. Little Easter's are when God's love is at work in our lives, seeking to bring life where there is darkness and death. The start of their journey was darkness and death. At the end of their journey, because of the little Easter that they encountered, there was joy and celebration and life. Absolutely incredible. Their ordinary lives experienced a little Easter. Friends, what I love about the Emmaus Walk is yes, they were two ordinary guys. But these two ordinary guys, this story of the Emmaus journey is a story of our spiritual lives. So just like they experienced little Easter's, we too can experience little Easter's in our lives along our spiritual journey. And it is so, so encouraging that we might be experiencing death and darkness and depression and despondency and being overwhelmed and broken. But when we encounter Jesus, when we encounter Jesus, everything changes. And we experienced our own little Easter's. And so today, just for a moment, I'm going to unpack four things that make Little Easter's possible in our lives. Four things that make Little Easter's possible. Are you ready to go? Yes. I need this 8.30 to encourage me. You know, it's pretty intimidating on Easter Sunday to stand up here. Are you ready to go? Yes. All right. The first thing uh, that makes Little Easter's possible is a friendship with Jesus. Church, it is possible for us to live in a friendship with Jesus, in a daily friendship with Jesus. This was God's original intent for our lives right from the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, he put Adam and Eve on the earth, and it says that he walked in the garden with them. And then sin took place. The sin of Adam and the sin of Eve and, and the sin of the serpent. And that sin, it separated us. It separated them from God. And so they could no longer walk in the garden as friends with God. And so he had to make a plan because his original design was for us to be friends with him. And so what he did is he sent his one and only son to take our place, to live a sinful life, to die on a cross for our sins and in our place in order for us to be reconciled back to God, in order for us to be able to live in daily friendship with Jesus. And today, friends, I'm here to say we each have been invited into a friendship with Jesus, but an invitation is, needs to either be accepted or rejected. We get to decide, yes, I want to live in daily friendship with Jesus or, hmm, not so sure that's the life I want. But each of us have a choice to make. And at the end of the service, I'm going to give us an opportunity to respond to whether we want to live in daily friendship with Jesus or not. But, it, but invitations are here to be accepted or rejected. So you might be here saying, oh, okay, Candace, yes, I want to live in daily friendship with Jesus, but how? I call it YBH. When pastors preach, I ask myself the question, yes, but how? Yes, I want to live in friendship with Jesus, but how? Yes, I want to be his friend in my daily life, but how? And I'm going to give us just a couple of easy tools for us to be friends with Jesus. And Pastor Trevor Hudson, he says this, that whatever is good for human friendships is good for our friendship with Jesus. And so I know that what's good for human friendships is time. I cannot be your friend if I do not spend time with you. We cannot be friends Another thing that's good for human friendship is mutual um, vulnerability. You know, there's only so, so many times we can talk about our dogs and the weather and our children. And then there actually needs to be a time when there is some mutual vulnerability, where you actually see who I am, and I actually see who you are. 
and there is a mutual vulnerability. Another thing that's good for human friendships is eating together, walking together, talking together. So all of these things are ways that we can experience friendship with Jesus. You know, we often come to Jesus only in a transactional way. When we want something. God, I'm on my knees, I'm asking you for something. That's not the only relationship that he wants for, with us. He wants a friendship with us. He wants us to be driving in our car and saying, oh, I'm so grateful for your presence in this moment. I love you, God. I love that you are with me. You know, there are, I've had friends in my life who've only ever wanted something from me. Those are not friends. Pretty soon you're like, I'm done. I have nothing left to give. There needs to be mutual reciprocity. I got it. (laughs) So daily friendship with Jesus opens up our lives to little Easter's. Daily friendship with Jesus. The second thing that makes little Easter's possible in our lives is shared life with each other shared life with each other. You know, when Jesus comes into our lives, he brings his whole big, fat Greek family with him. (laughs) Or in my case, big, fat Lebanese family. He brings them with. Whether we like them or not, he brings his family with. You know, our salvation, it might be personal, but it is not private. It is a social salvation. In other words, I cannot work out my salvation alone. I need the people in this room, and I need the people in my life group uh, to help me to work out my salvation. It's in community that we are the body of Christ. We're not the body of Christ alone. Then we are just a toe, missing the rest of our bodies, right? We are the body of Christ with each other. We cannot work out our salvation without one another. Jesus died for the church. You know, I've heard people say, oh, I love Jesus, but I really hate the church. I am sorry to like burst your bubble if this is what you've said. They are inseparable. Christ and his bride are inseparable. You know, have you ever had a a, a couple friend where you and your husband or or your partner or your boyfriend are trying to find some couple friends, and you go out for dinner, and of course, Pastor Brian would always come back saying, oh, I just loved that guy. He was incredible. We had so much to talk about, and I'll be like, "Mm, um." (laughs) that lady was lovely. I have nothing against her. I just have absolutely nothing in common with her. Like... And right there in that moment, he knows that that friendship is over. Right there. Now, if we say that we do not love the church, right there, that friendship is over. Because Jesus died for the church. He gave his life for the church. This is what he's coming back for. He's not coming back for one toe. He's coming back for a beautiful bride. And yes, the church, there's the worst of church, and and we've probably all experienced the worst of church. Why? Because we are all recovering sinners, friends. I haven't got it all together. You haven't got it all together. And my recovering sinfulness rubs off against your recovering sinfulness. And at times, I need to extend grace and mercy. And at times, many, many times, ask the production team. They have to extend grace and mercy towards me. And that's okay. Jesus is reminding us that we need each other. We need his forgiveness. We need his grace. We need his mercy. And every one of us are recovering sinners. And so we need to extend grace, mercy, forgiveness. But friends, I've also seen the best of the church. I have seen the church feed the poor. 
I've seen the church distribute hope bags, comfort the grieving, deliver meals and flowers to those in life groups who have gone through a a tough time, buy school shoes and stationery for each other. I've seen the church help grade two learners to read. I've seen the church go on mission trips to Mozambique and Zimbabwe and Zambia. I've seen the church fund mission wells. I've seen the church distribute blankets in winter. I've seen the church donate blood and sponsor kids for camps and pray for one another and love one another and encourage one another and heal one another and worship alongside one another and serve alongside one another. The local church is beautiful when the local church is working right. And the local church is a place that I experience little Easter's. And the local church is a place where you too can experience little Easter's. So you might be here saying, yes, but how, Candace? Yes, but how? Plant yourself in a local church. Get messy with people who you need to forgive. That's what the church is about. Plant yourself in a life group and love no matter what happens in that life group. Plant yourself in a life group. Serve along someone, uh, somebody that's going to make you gray and crazy and then forgive them anyway. <laughs> Stay after the service today. Have a cup of coffee. Coffee. Woo. <laughs> too much emotion here. Have a cup of coffee with someone. Be the church. Be the church and experience little Easter's. The third thing that makes little Easter's possible in our lives is allowing our lives to gradually be transformed. Gradually. We often say here at Thrive that we want to be with Jesus in order to become like Jesus. I'm going to give you the yes, but how right now. How do we become like Jesus? We need to be with Him. There is no substitute for our time with Jesus. And yes, coming to church is incredible, but it is not the same as your daily time with Him. If you spend time with Him daily, slowly but surely, He starts to rub off on you. And you start to look more beautiful, more like Him. You experience more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, because Jesus has rubbed off on you. You know, you know those couples who have been together for like 50 years, and they start to look like each other? Yeah? Right. Anybody know the... Yeah. Listen... Pastor Byron and I, we've been married 20 years and dated five, and we still come out dressed for church, and I'm like, you are changing. (laughs) We look too alike. And if you don't have a partner, that's okay. You start to look like your pets. (laughs) What? We rub off on each other. Hey, but I want to look more like Jesus. Not like my pet or my partner, no. More like Jesus. It's a gradual transformation. Friends, I want to say this is not a do-it-yourself project. I cannot change myself. It is impossible. I cannot go, okay, more love, more love, pop out love. More joy, more joy. No. The only way I get more of the fruit of the Spirit, Scripture tells me, is by abiding, staying connected to Jesus, is the only way I produce more of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. And let me encourage you and dishearten you all at the same time. It it is gradual. It is two steps forward. Oh, I look more like Jesus today. One step back, because my old self comes back in full force. And it is two steps forward, and it is one step back. But over time, give it time, we start to look more like Jesus. You know, 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says this, But we Christians have no veil over our faces. We can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more, say it with me, and more like Him. We become more and more like Jesus over time. Give it time. 
Then things like our usual response in traffic, when it's not to allow that person, and I have been in this lane for 15 minutes and that person is not pushing in, when all of a sudden we break and we let them in, we have experienced a little Easter. When instead of exploding in anger, we ask just one more question, because maybe, maybe this, maybe there's the best in this person. <laughs> in that moment, we experience a little Easter. When our hearts are moved with compassion towards the beggar, instead of feeling disdain because there's another beggar and I can't deal with this, we have experienced a little Easter. When we greet our car guards and we thank them and we look at them in their eyes, we don't have to give them money. We experience a little Easter. I'm just gonna stand on this side of the stage because my parents are over there. <laughs> when we honor our parents when they are driving us crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we experience a little, Easter. come on, say it with me, a little, Easter. when we forgive instead of holding a grudge, we experience a little Easter. When we allow somebody else's needs to take preference over ours, we experience a little Easter. And gradually, our ordinary, everyday lives start to look a little bit more like Jesus's. The final thing that makes Little Easter's possible in our lives is living an empowered life. You know, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he said to his disciples, wait here in Jerusalem, because I am sending one who is going to give you power for your everyday lives. And then the Holy Spirit came and he, he landed upon them and filled them and Within them and out of their lives, they started to live an empowered life, a life full of the Holy Spirit. And you might be saying, yes, but how? Friends, I'm here to encourage you that the moment you invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and friend is the very moment the Holy Spirit fills your life and He gives you power for everyday living. He empowers you, and yes, it may take some time for you to discern His promptings, and that's okay, but the Holy Spirit has come upon you in power when you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and friend, and we get to live and experience little Easter's when we are empowered, when we find strength beyond ourselves to face days we thought we could never face, the Holy Spirit has empowered us. And we have experienced a little Easter. When we have unexplained peace, when actually there should be turmoil in our lives, we have experienced the Holy Spirit's empowering, and we have experienced a little Easter. When we experience comfort in times of grief, when there should be great mourning, but we've experienced comfort, we have experienced the Holy Spirit's empowering and again, a little Easter in our lives. So let's recap. Friends, our ordinary everyday lives, we can experience resurrection in them. You know, the resurrection, the big resurrection has enabled us to have little resurrections daily. 2,000 years ago, there was a big resurrection but resurrection is present continuous. It should be taking place daily in our lives, in the lives of Christ followers, where darkness and death and despair turns to joy and celebration. That's what we should be experiencing. And one day, there will be a final resurrection when friends of Jesus will ascend into heaven for all of eternity. So resurrection was not just for then, but it's for now and it's for our lives. Over time, our ordinary everyday lives will experience little Easter's and little Easter's and little Easter's. 
and places of resurrection. And the places of resurrection are in four places. Firstly, the first place of resurrection is a friendship with Jesus. And in a moment, I'm going to extend an invite for those who are not yet friends of Jesus. But the first little resurrection, the little Easter, is a friendship with Jesus. The second resurrection, the second little Easter, is a shared life in community. We can only be the body with the rest of the body. That's where we experience little Easter's. The third place is when my life gradually transforms. Where all of the negative stuff in my life is replaced with more of the fruit of the Spirit, I am experiencing more little Easter's. And finally, when I live an empowered life by Christ's Spirit. And over time, this is the best part, little Easter, after little Easter, say it with me, after little Easter, after... After, after, I'm going to let the balcony talk because you're just staring at me. (gasps) After, after, little Easter, after little Easter, after little Easter, after little Easter, my ordinary life will begin to roar. And your ordinary life, it will begin to roar. Friends, our lives will roar if we allow the little Easter's to take place in our lives, if we allow the transformation of our friendship with Jesus to take place, if we allow the, trans, the community of God to, to form me, little Easter's will take place. When we allow the Holy Spirit to empower me, little Easter's will take place. And my life will start to look more like Christ's. A life that loves like Christ and lives like Christ, and roars like Christ, and reverberates into eternity because of all the little Easter's. Let's take a moment to respond to what we've heard here today. Would you bow your head, close your eyes in this moment? Friends, I don't wanna allow this Easter to pass without offering each of us here in the auditorium and even those watching online an opportunity to experience your first little Easter. And that first little Easter, as we've spoken about, is a friendship with Jesus. Jesus wants a friendship with us, not a transactional relationship, but actually a friendship where we tell Him who we are and and He gets to know us and love us and we get to know Him and love Him. And Christ's invitation in this moment is for us to be His friend. So perhaps it's your first time in church and you've never known that Jesus wants to be your friend. Or perhaps you've been in church for years and you've actually just been going through the motions and have not asked Him to be your friend in your daily life. Well, today's your opportunity to experience this first little Easter. Today, each of us get a chance to decide and invite Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of our lives. And because of the big Easter on the cross, Today, we get to experience this little Easter. And so if this is you in a moment, I'm gonna ask you to pop up your hand. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. This is just a way for you to indicate that you would like to be included in this prayer. Uh, And so on the count of three, if you wanna be included in this prayer, a prayer inviting Jesus to be your Lord, Savior, but mostly your friend in this moment, would you raise your hand? One, two, three. Three, thank you, I see those hands. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So many hands. Thank you on the balcony, I'm looking there. Thank you at the back here. Thank you, I see your hands in the balcony over there. Thank you over there. Just keep raising your hands. Thank you over there. Thank you on the balcony. Come on, Jesus is inviting you in this moment. Thank you over here. It's an invitation you get to choose or reject. Thank you, thank you. So many decisions today. Thank you at the back. Thank you over there. Thank you. It's the best decision you will ever make, making Jesus your friend. One last look across the auditorium. If you've raised your hand, you're welcome to pop it down. Um, If you want to still indicate, I'm looking. Thank you, I see your hand in the balcony. One last look. Thank you, I see you. Come on, let's pray together. And as I said, we're the body of Christ, which means that we're going to pray this prayer together as the body of Christ for those who have raised their hands today. Would you repeat this prayer after me? 
Dear Father God, uh, all together in one voice, let's do this again. Dear Father God, I come before you today with a humble heart and I surrender my life to you. I believe that Jesus Christ was born sin free, died on the cross as a payment for my own sin and rose three days later. Please forgive my sins and make me new. Thank you for your gifts of grace and mercy. Please help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody together said a resounding amen.